Zephyr's Curse, a Grimoire Chronicles novelette, book 0.5, written by Zelda Knight, narrated by Nyamka Neveri and Kai Tolliver. Astral magic is the dominion of Ngangwa, crown jewel of the cosmic order. Ye who seeks their awesome power, ye who reads this wicked grimoire in defiance of our gods, will unleash unfathomable horror upon the mortal realm. I, the warlock of misfortune, have faced the end of days. I, the harbinger of destruction, will usher in the age of obsidian. Ye who reads this wicked grimoire will be cursed forevermore, for the key of knowledge is a double-edged sword, fatal poison without a cure. Excerpt from the Book of Alabaza the Brave Chapter 1. Zephyr The unmistakable smell of fey blood assaulted Zephyr's nose as she rounded a street corner and burst into Lincoln Park Zoo. The sky was pitch black, the stars obscured by rows of wispy fog blotting out the flickering city lights surrounding her. The park itself was lit up like a Christmas tree, devoid of any humans, as the holiday season surrendered itself to the bitter cold that was Chicago-style winters. But none of that really mattered to Zephyr in that moment. The only thing she cared about was putting one foot in front of the other and avoiding being captured. Circling above her, just out of sight, three of her fellow winged shifters were stalking her. Scratch that, she thought as she dove into a bush to escape the talons of a swooping harpy. They're trying to kill me, not capture me alive. Zephyr rolled onto her back and got back to her feet, zigzagging through the winding curves of the free city zoo, pounding the cobblestone pavement so hard she was certain rocks were dislodging from the ground. Her chest heaved, thin black shirt soaked in sweat, two tight blue jeans cutting into her thighs as Zephyr finally arrived at the zoo's swan pond, one of the many entrances to the realm of the nightshade. She leaned against the railing of the artificial oasis, astonished she'd made it that far with her head still on her shoulders. Slumping against the railing, all Zephyr could do was laugh at herself. Who knew searching for scrap metal would ignite a cosmic war? She mused ruefully, imagining the trio of monsters chasing after her, swooping in for the kill. I guess if you play cosmic games, you should expect cosmic consequences for your actions. Zephyr wanted to curl into herself and rest. She didn't want to deal with whatever the hell she'd gotten herself mixed up in. Her knees threatened to buckle at the enormity of the consequences she was facing, alone. If she wanted to live through the night, she had to get out of Chicago and into the Underrealm, fast. However, her moment of peace was short-lived. Out of the shadows, a dark green goblin with matching bat wings sprung forward. It cackled as she gasped in shock, striking Zephyr in her solar plexus with a wooden stick as thin as a toothpick, but as powerful as a sledgehammer. Zephyr yelled, chest and ribs aching from the impact of the goblin's staff, as she was thrust up and over the ledge of the railing. She sunk underwater, fighting to reach the surface the pond stretching downward for what felt like an eternity. Usually, she could use her magic to weather the transition between realms. But as it was, Zephyr was unable to think rationally, panic overtaking her good sense. She would pop up, then sink back down, never having learned how to swim without the aid of the supernatural. She was certain more demons were lurking in the shadows, teasing her, waiting for their turn to inflict some unwarranted punishment all because she mistook a key for some easy money. As if on cue, the harpy landed, feathered body and head the color of a barn owl, sandy white and light brown. Her large, unblinking black eyes glowed with malicious intent. As the goblin shot up into the air and landed on her left wing where a human arm should be, Next came the griffin who reared up on his lion paws and transformed into something almost human, his tail curling around himself to cover his exposed sex. The demons laughed cruelly as Zephyr fought for air, unable to free herself from the clutches of the ice-cold, putrid green pond water. Birdbrain doesn't know what she has stolen, a feminine voice hissed, no doubt coming from the harpy. 
she'll die soon enough, and we'll take it from her. Her loss, our gain, and a win for the nightshade. A booming masculine voice chimed in, his hearty laughter bouncing off the freezing wind. Soon, very soon. But what if she responds? What if the other we killed? Will she come back for revenge? The goblin chirped, dagger-like teeth gnashing together in a painful symphony. The trio of shifters continued to argue until Zephyr couldn't hear them anymore. Maybe it was for the best. Zephyr didn't want to hear them squabbling over how they'd kill her. She convinced herself to welcome death. If she died and they took the key, she would be released from any responsibility for what came next, Zephyr reasoned. It was a weak excuse not to fight any longer, but it was enough for her. Zephyr stopped struggling to breach the water's surface, instead sinking like a rock to the bottom of the bottomless portal. Soon, her corrupted soul would return to the realm of the nightshade. She'd either be reborn or reshuffled into a new body. That was fine with her. It took her over a hundred years to perfect her soul in the form of a crow. Maybe, in her next life, Zephyr would be a vulture so she could pick at the griffins, harpies, and goblins' bones when the big guns from downstairs got wind of their betrayal. Maybe. Maybe. As Zephyr felt her consciousness wavering, her only thought was how much she wanted to strangle her best friend. Chapter 2 Zephyr It won't kill you to try. Zephyr looked up and over at Nalawazi, sipping on a toxic-smelling and bitter-tasting brew humans called alcohol. Around them, those same humans danced, their feet stamping to the rhythm of some distant drum whose powerful beating caused Zephyr's ears to ring. She clutched her chest, nearly falling off her stool. The force of the vibrating music made her mistake her beating heart for a heart attack. She still wasn't used to her human body or being so close to human society. Even after joining the ranks of the Nightshade with the ability to shapeshift at will, she preferred to be curled up with her trinkets inside of her nest as a crow. Calm down. Their bodies are weaker than ours, but not so fragile they'd give out from a little music, Nolawazi said, grinning, gapped front teeth giving her a childish aura. Even though she had a good century or two on Zephyr, her charcoal black skin caught the harsh, colorful lights flashing in the nightclub, pearly white teeth nearly blinding. Her drooping eyes and full lips were painted blood red, eyeshadow a ghostly white, and black eyeliner as charcoal black as her skin. Her clothing was almost as loud as her personality, something in between Mad Max and post-punk rocker. As a kinsna Turaco shifter straight from the continent of Africa, Nolawazi was already a rare breed, but it was her personality, spoken and unsaid characteristics, that made her one of a kind, unforgettable, and sometimes a little bit of an asshole. I know, I know, Zephyr said, avoiding the intense gaze of a drunk human man. Still, I don't know how much longer I can hold up in this body. Riding the L and being trapped inside the equivalent of it past midnight is a very different story. Everything and everyone is so obnoxiously loud. I guess, Zeze, I sort of like it, though. Humans are so loud and proud and foolish. It's almost endearing in a way, don't you think? Nothing like the stuffy formality of our realm and our kind. And that's a good thing. Nolawazi turned to face the exit, dyed atomic green mohawk bopping as she did. Mm-hmm. Anyway, cut the shit, Nola, and tell me the truth. What's the real reason you dragged me to this human den tonight, huh? I know it's not to nurse my broken heart with this vile drink they're guzzling down, Zephyr scoffed. Nola took a swig of her beer and grinned again, slamming her fist against the wood covering the countertop. I got a job for us. Zephyr stared at her companion before bolting up and nearly making a beeline for the door. Nolawazi dragged her back to her seat, muscular arms flexing as she laughed. Come on now, you haven't even heard my side of the story yet. Because I know it's some bullshit. Let me guess, one of the Bell sisters pumped your head full of some nonsense again about digging up divine scrap metal, huh? It's that same mission, isn't it? 
about raiding their dead great-great-great-whatever's tomb? Zephyr sat back down reluctantly. Not the Bell sisters, silly. I got this info on my own, even though I had to question them because the jobs related to them, quite literally. Besides, Solana Bell quit bounty hunting. She swears anything that has to do with Nightshade like us has nothing to do with her. Injustice? Well, she's about as heartbroken as you are. She'd be no good to us on a dangerous mission, but I would be. Zephyr countered, cutting her off. Nilawazi snorted, hard. Look, she's dealing with a real breakup with a man that was practically her fiancé. You, on the other hand, couldn't tell the difference between a sex friend and a boyfriend. That's your problem. Ouch, Zephyr thought, crossing her arms across her chest in an act of defiance, even as her face sunk. It was the truth. But damn it if the truth didn't hurt. She didn't even know the source of her broken heart's real name. Hell, for all she knew, Zeke was an alias. But that hadn't stopped Zephyr from planning a future together for them regardless. Tall, blonde, and brooding, honey-brown skin and matching hair falling past his hips in mesmerizing corkscrew curls, a rugged smile and wickedly piercing steel-gray eyes. There were a lot of adjectives Zephyr could use for Zeke. The human man that quite literally swept her off her feet in another nightclub a few months back when she'd come to Chicago to sleep on Nilawazi's couch. Well, her initial goal had been to find a job and her own place. However, finding work as a human was harder than expected. But Zephyr wasn't one to complain, especially when after a hard week job searching, she could spend her weekends in the arms of her mysterious lover. Only, her mysterious lover had gone and mysteriously disappeared on her a week ago, and now Zephyr wasn't so sure if being human was worth it anymore. So, you in or what? Nilawazi snapped her fingers in front of her face. The lights of the club began flickering and the human's movements slowed down to a crawl. A man tumbled over, drunk, but it would take hours before he hit the floor. The DJ raised her fist to get the crowd going but they were suspended mid-air. Nilawazi had placed Zephyr and herself into a time pocket to discuss in private. It was smart, because they never knew who or what might be eavesdropping. Their words would be intelligible once sped back up. Let's say I'm all in, and I'm not committed to anything right now, by the way. What's in it for me that's worth the risk of being stripped of my soul? They'd pledged themselves to the legitimate leader of the Nightshade, His Highness Prince Raphael of the Dragon Shifters who united all winged demon shifters under his dominion. He was easygoing enough, if a bit of a pompous jerk like all royalty in their realm were, but he was strict about one rule and one rule only. The Nightshade under his control would not interfere with human affairs. Digging up a dead human warlock's grave sounded like the definition of getting tangled up in human affairs. I mean, for sure, there could be death, doom, and misery waiting behind that magical door. For sure. But there could also be ancient wisdom, glory, and unimaginable wealth trapped inside just waiting for two badass chicks to crack the code and discover it. Besides, our prince might hate humans but he loves money more than anything. He'll reward us kindly, not punish us, if what this map says pans out. Nilawazi pulled out said map from thin air and spread it out on the countertop. Aha. Uh-huh. So why do you need me again? Zephyr couldn't help but trace the ancient parchment with her fingertips, the old thrill of being on the verge of discovery weaving its way back into her bones because you're the only one that paid attention in those classes they make us take. You can read this, can't you, Zeze? So I'm thinking you can read what's inside that tomb, too. Zephyr focused on the curvy symbols that adorned the map, realizing she did understand the language and it wasn't a good sign. Oh, hell no. This is fake, Nola. I'm not getting dragged into some tri-realm nonsense over a hunch, Zephyr yelled. Zeze? Don't be such a wimp. King Emmanuel ain't gonna do shit. What he finna do? Send his armies against two low-level bird shifters? Over what? An old book and some scrap metal he's probably forgotten about. 
If anything, this being in Phaic means the treasure inside the tomb is damn near priceless to us, and insignificant to them. It's so old they wrote down the location, but Nagangwa knows Faze lives so long that time doesn't make them treasure anything. Plus, it's been a millennia since anyone has seen a fey in our realm, or the human realm. Shoot, last I heard, King Emmanuel became Aether. He's probably floating around in some realm between realms, tired of putting up with our shit. Nolawazi was going on a tangent, getting worked up because Zephyr was being so belligerent. Aether or man, we'd potentially have Faze, our prince, and humans on our asses if things go wrong. I don't think we should do this, Nola. Zephyr slumped in her chair. What's really holding you back, Zeze? Because these are a bunch of excuses I'm hearing. When did you ever care about intra-realm politics? Think Zeke's gonna come back while we're gone? Wake up, Zeze! Humans are irrational and fickle beings. Stop chasing after Adonis and get your pot of gold. Nola slapped the map this time, and it disappeared back into a void. Sometimes Nolawazi's perceptiveness and knack for telling the truth was a curse. She usually saw right through Zephyr's fake, nonchalant attitude at the prospect of adventure. And she was seeing right through her cautious mask now. There was no denying Zephyr was itching for a late-night thrill to replace what Zeke used to provide for her. And if things really went south, they could always blame humanity and avoid the brunt of Prince Raphael's wrath. What felt like eons getting to know human culture felt hollow once she discovered their lives revolved around going to work, drinking themselves into a stupor, and passing out only to do it all over again. True, she was grossly exaggerating the human condition based on a few dive bars in Illinois. That said, when had humans ever given her kind the benefit of the doubt? To them, they were demons or pest, both of which needed to be eradicated for them to live. So why not stir up a little trouble and get something out of it in the process? Zephyr hadn't spent a century perfecting her spirit to waste it trying to understand the idiosyncrasies of humans, nor wait for a man who wasn't coming back for her. She puckered her lips before smirking, matching Nalawazi's toothy grin. Fine, let's find that tomb. But if this goes bust, you owe me another diamond for my nest. Zephyr was beginning to remember why she never listened to Nalawazi's harebrained schemes. They crept around in the darkness, still in their human skin. However, their wings fanned out behind them, Zephyr's pure black to Nola's vibrant green. They'd found the tomb with some difficulty, protected by a powerful energy field on the beaches of Lake Michigan. The water was freezing cold that time of year, and Zephyr was less than amused to be wading around in the water looking for a literal pebble among stones. Then they hit pay dirt and began chanting in unison. And you could be the winner. And you could be the winner. And you could be the winner. The summoning spell rolled off their lips like the water surrounding them until a tear in the fabric of reality emerged. It grew and grew until a mound of earth emerged from the sandy shore, with a large ornate wooden door in the middle shaped like a wide obelisk. At the center of the door was a depression where they assumed a doorknob should be, covered with symbols older than the phaic on the map they used to locate the tomb. This it? Zephyr asked as the enchantment faded, the door wavering before their eyes. They didn't have much time to figure out how to get inside before it disappeared once more. She reached out to touch the depression jumping back as what felt like a vault of pure electricity lashed out at her. Gotta be. What else would look this old and ugly? Plus, the vibe isn't right. It feels like old world magic. Something from my homeland, but much older. Now, how to open the door? Nilawazi tried to touch the door this time around, but was pushed back all the same. They were on the verge of giving up when suddenly, the door swung wide open. A musty wind streaming out from within the darkness that greeted them. Tell me, Nola, is it before or after a creepy door opens itself that we're supposed to run? Zephyr asked, her sarcasm obvious. Trick question? Neither. 
We won't know what's inside if we don't enter the creepy door, now will we? Without flinching, Nilawazi marched inside as Zephyr floated after her, frightened underneath her show of bravado. They traveled down a series of interconnected tunnels until they emerged in what looked like the gateway to their realm. The vaulted ceiling and numerous portals were familiar, but they looked too new. They chose doors at random first, but after a while they realized that was a losing strategy. The monsters that chased them inside the various foreign realms inside the portals didn't lead them to a book of any kind. Finally, they came upon a portal that led to a small stone room at the end of a much bigger cave. The duo marveled at the mounds of glittering scrap metal that surrounded them, all of which was forged in the realm of the divine, a subset of the fey realm. The translucent shards captured what little light was inside, glittering in a rainbow of colors, virtually indestructible material used to create the weapons of the ascended races. Nilawazi was the first to step forward. She tested the ground beneath her boots, wary of stepping into a trap. Sensing that everything was okay, she nodded for her friend to follow her as she ventured deeper inside. Zephyr did so, reluctant as ever. Here, Nilawazi said as she waved Zephyr over. She flew the short distance and stopped next to her friend. I think this is it. Inside, propped up by a large pedestal made of ancient runes, was what they'd been looking for, too. A dusty old book. It was sealed shut by a heavy lock, the chains wrapped around made of pure elemental magic. Earth, fire, air, water, wood, metal, and aether. Zephyr had only heard about practitioners with the ability to bend the seven elements and keep them pure in books. But now, she was seeing it for herself. Looks like a rare grimoire, don't you think? The Book of... Nilawazi began reading the cryptic title. Alabaza the Brave. Zephyr finished her sentence. Raw power emanated from the jet-black tome in waves. Zephyr swallowed the lump forming in her throat, hard. She was never a good student always preferring to fool around with her friends rather than hit the ancient tomes of knowledge her master pressed her to read. Now, she wished with everything in her spirit she'd listened more closely back then. What they'd stumbled upon was more important than they'd ever know. Zephyr just knew it. Zephyr looked up and down and all around until she spotted what looked like a key wedged into the heart of the pedestal. She took it with some effort and stuck it into the lock. Holding her breath, she spun the key and the lock flew open, the seven heavy chains around the book shattering and disappearing. Zephyr waited, unsure what came next. When nothing bad happened, she shrugged and dropped the key in between her breasts held up by her bra. It was one feature she appreciated about humans, their easy access to storage. What does it say? What is it? Nolawazi asked, her wings against Zephyr's as she guarded their rear. To be honest with you, Nola, I don't know what the hell this says, Zephyr said as she flipped the pages. The cover had been in a language they both knew, but the interior pages were beyond her comprehension. Didn't you say you studied the ancient tongues? Nolawazi asked, turning so she was facing the book trying to read it as she looked down over Zephyr's head. Yeah, studied, not mastered them. This is some archaic human dialect. The best I can make out is portions of arcane spells. Maybe it's just some old warlock's spellbook and nothing more. Zephyr lied, knowing in her heart of hearts that the book wasn't nothing. But you can feel it, can't you? That trembling in your bones. I can feel it too, like something ancient, something mystic is just beyond reach. And if we open it and find the treasure inside, hell, we won't have to worry about pesky human landlords or our nagging prince ever again. We'll be too rich to care. Zephyr sighed as Nilawazi shook her shoulders, careful not to get tangled up in her wings. You sure about this? 
Is scrap metal and a book we can't read really worth the risk? Zephyr trailed off as the book began to tremble in her hands. Something's wrong, she thought, refusing to give voice to her fears. Everything from locating the portal to finding the treasure inside undisturbed seemed too easy to be real. A deep-seated fear was settling in her gut. She didn't know how or why, but Zephyr knew they needed to get out of there. What about this? I know you can read Faik. Nolawazi pointed to a string of symbols on an open page. Something about astral magic and harnessing it, I think. Zephyr was trying to figure out how many steps it took to get back to the portal. Bullshit. Only Nagangwa has that type of power. No fey, no nightshade, and especially not a mere human warlock could harness that type of ability. I doubt even the Demi Divine could do it, Nilawazi stated. Before you interrupt me again, that's not what he's saying. It's more like a warning veiled as a curse. Just the pursuit of arcane knowledge will lead to the Age of Obsidian. That's what I'm gathering from it anyway. Zephyr continued to count backward, if only to calm herself down. Age of Obsidian? Sounds kick-ass. Ooh, we should start a band called... For the second time that night, Zephyr cut her off. Can't we just take the metal and go? Zephyr pleaded, her stomach lurching. Oh, don't be such a baby, Zeze. It's just a book. It can't hurt you, I promise. The older woman tilted her head backward, flashing her signature grin but it soon melted away, replaced by an expression that could only be read as true terror. Zephyr felt something warm coat her wings as Nilawazi slumped forward, eyes glassy, before dissolving into a pillar of white light. Zephyr was screaming before she knew it, falling forward as something sharp nicked her back. She watched as the grim war was snatched away by an iron-tipped whip. She rolled onto her back, face covered in tears, as three sets of glowing eyes stared back at her from the mouth of the cave. They came closer and closer still until the paw of a lion entered the stone room. Zephyr gasped in shock as three demons entered, a mighty griffin, a beautiful harpy acting as a griffin rider, and a ghoulish goblin blocked the entrance. Chapter 3 Zephyr Zephyr's mind was forced back into the present as the talons of the harpy hounding her slashed the air right in front of her face. She screamed, thrusting backward, but she didn't move. She was levitating above the dark waters of the pond, soaking wet and confused. No, she wasn't levitating at all, she realized. Zephyr was being held up, pressed against someone's side. Her eyes focused long enough so she could make out her savior. She regretted it almost instantly. He was dressed head to toe in flowing black robes, blonde hair tied back and braided. She couldn't see his eyes, only the cut of his sharp chin. But Zephyr had an inkling his eyes were most likely covered as well. Either she was under the glamour of a powerful fay, or she was face to face with one of the ascended. Both options were worse than bad. It could prove deadly. If she remembered correctly from her days in the Temple of Knowledge, thrones wore blindfolds so they could judge the living without bias. Fays supposedly wore them because gazing into their eyes could drive other beings mad. Both had an explicit duty to punish unruly members of the Nightshade, Fays, and humans. And demons fighting over a grim war in the human realm seemed right up their alley. It all sounded like bullshit to her back then but seeing one up close seemed to confirm her master's lessons. So why, Zephyr thought fleetingly, did he save me? Wah! Zephyr screamed as the throne or fay maneuvered to dodge the blow of the griffin rider. He drove his broadsword through her chest and she burst into a pillar of light. He dispensed with the griffin shortly thereafter, his massive body exploding into nothingness. Zephyr would have screamed again if the stranger hadn't dived headfirst towards the heart of the zoo. He thrust Zephyr aside once they landed, and began slaying demons, the toothy goblin one of his first victims, 
Then he began walking away, deserting Zephyr who was still stunned into silence. A white feather landed on Zephyr's head, confirming her suspicion that the man was a throne and not a fey warrior. She scrambled to follow the throne because she had no other choice. It was either him or a den full of ravenous fellow demons ready to rip her apart. He was tall and didn't seem concerned about how she kept up with him. So Zephyr had to basically run to catch up with his long strides. Every corner they turned, a new monster appeared. Each was dispensed with in quick succession like they were nothing. It frightened Zephyr how easily the Ascended thrust his long spear into her comrades without flinching, but took solace in the fact that they'd be reborn by morning. Dazed and confused, yes, but they'd come back in the realm of the Nightshade unscratched. That is, if they weren't selected to be reborn completely and thrust into the Chamber of Renewal. The Loazi would be back too. And all Zephyr could do was pray to whoever really listened to them that she wasn't slotted for a renewal. If it were her doing the slaying, and Zephyr's opponents were ever ascended, that would be the end for them. So, Zephyr reasoned, it made sense he could plow through them without flinching. None of them really died, anyway. Thank you, she said as they arrived back at Swan Pond where the portal was located. The throne turned to face her his sword resting in its sheath. The pitch-black starless sky made it difficult for Zephyr to read his expression, his eyes covered by a thin black cloth barely visible beneath it. Zephyr was about to hop over the railing when the throne spoke for the first time. Be gone, he replied, raising his weapon, his voice dripping with conflicted emotions. It took Zephyr a moment to process the fact that he wasn't pointing it at another demon— he was aiming the diamond-tipped blade at her heart. She dodged left as the tip of his golden sword pierced the cobblestone walkway. Pieces of rock ricocheting in every direction. Stop! She shouted, lifting off the ground as he turned, angling the blade at her head. It barely missed her, but the ascended energy made her skin burn. No! She spat, overwhelmed by the reality of her situation. The dull iron key nestled in her cleavage began to glow. She flinched, resisting the urge to rip it off and hurl it into the dark water. Be still. Your energy is ruinous, and you must be banished. The pain is momentary, and you will be reborn in your proper place. But first, hand over the key so you can be forgiven, fledgling. Refuse and be banished to the void. He shouted, slicing at the air as Zephyr dodged just in time to not lose her head. That's when it hit her. The voice she was hearing. The height. The honey-brown skin and matching curly hair. She could hardly believe it. But her eyes and ears confirmed what her heart already knew. She knew this throne. This warrior sent to kill her. Wait, Zeke! It's me! She shouted once more his sword hovering right in front of her nose. He moved to finish what he started, Zephyr shaking on the ground beneath him. But it was like he couldn't bring himself to finish her off. He grunted, ripping his blindfold off, revealing conflicted steel-gray eyes. Zeke's conflicted steel-gray eyes. You remember me? He whispered underneath his breath, angry. Duh! It's only been a week, man. Put that thing away and let's talk like civilized beings. Zephyr tried to keep her voice steady. How did you acquire the key, fledgling? Don't lie to me. I cannot see it, but I know you have it. He didn't even make an attempt to sound friendly. If he was going to pretend like he didn't know her, Zephyr knew she had to get creative. What? What key? Zephyr pretended she didn't know what he was talking about, all but certain it was the reason he was sent to slay her. He frowned before looking skyward. I do not have time for your games. He is near and we must go. I will retrieve the key in your realm. When his back was turned, she ripped the key from her aching chest and thrust it into her back pocket. Zephyr was pretty sure the crappy key that belonged to the shitty book that brought her so much misery just branded her chest. 
but she was already juggling too many balls in her overworked brain. She couldn't worry about permanent scarring right then and there. She also couldn't reveal all the aces under her sleeve just yet if she wanted to live long enough to get away. Come. What part of we don't have time didn't make sense? Zephyr? She shivered when he said her name, staring down at her with that all-too-familiar gaze. She hesitated before leaping up and into his arms. His chest was broad and warm, just like she remembered. She took one look back at the glittering Chicago skyline, then looked up at Zeke with determination in her eyes. Without another word, he burst into the air, pure white wings slashing the night sky, tipped over, and took them both barreling down into the portal between dimensions. Ah! Zephyr surfaced inside of a cave filled with portals, a familiar one, now battle-worn, unlike the shiny version her and Nilawazi saw before, a parallel world to that of the human realm, the realm of the nightshade. Zephyr did her best to recover, sprawled out on the rocky shores of the parallel pond on the other side. When she could stand, she glared up at Zeke, who looked down at her, annoyed. Come! He ordered as she tugged on his flowy pants leg. Not until I know your real name, she said. He flinched. Why does that matter, fledgling? Because for some reason you're trying to put distance between us and I don't like it. You know my real name and that means you have power over me. I should know yours. It's only fair, isn't it? We're in this together now, aren't we? Your bosses sent you to kill me, not drag me along with you, right? They're watching you, so why keep pretending you don't know me, huh? That seemed to hit Zeke where it hurt. He mulled over his answer for some time before finally stating, I am Ezekiel, ambassador of the thrones, keeper of order. You will call me Ezekiel. Now, come. I have pierced the veil between our realms, but it is unnatural for me to be here. We must recover a gem so I can return, and then you will hand over the key. He started to walk, so Zephyr stood and tried to keep up as she was learning to do. After passing through a series of portals, they emerged in a cave not unlike the one Nilawazi and her found the Grimoire in. However, this one had a single door instead of a pedestal. He opened it, and a crack formed in the rocks, shooting upward and peeling open to reveal a massive portal with something else inside. It was getting hard to keep up with all the portal pockets, but Zephyr did her best. Ezekiel motioned towards a gateway adorned with the skulls of giants. A shiver ran down Zephyr's spine. She curled her wings around herself for protection. Looking at the bones feels like a hex, she thought absently. Embedded in the eye sockets of two of the three skulls were runes. She walked up to the gateway, doing her best not to gag at the stench of decay. Squatting to inspect the ground... Zephyr reasoned one of the runes was missing. There were only three realms after all. Nightshade, Fae, and Human. The magic radiating from the runes matched that of the gateway. Zephyr glanced at the hilt of the Ascended's broad sword. On the hilt, a gem shined bright, translucent like the divine scrap metal they found in the warlock's grave. There's no doubt it's the rune he seeks. That's the only way he could have pierced the veil. So why is he asking me if I stole it? It doesn't make any sense. Lost in her thoughts, Zephyr didn't notice Ezekiel approaching until it was too late. So? Ezekiel boomed impatiently, mere inches away. She squawked in terror and leapt to her feet. Spinning around, Zephyr gulped as the guardian sheathed his sword and stepped forward in one fluid motion. Before she could step back, he lifted her chin upward the palm of his hand resting on her throat. It's calloused. Zeke's hand has always been calloused. I always expected the highborn to be smooth all over. So, so, I don't know. I didn't borrow a rune, and whatever is protecting this gate is archaic magic. I'm a low-level crow shifter, not demonic royalty. Also, I borrowed... Stole. He cut her off, sneering. Borrowed a key. She snapped back. 
Zephyr realized her mistake when a smug grin crept across Ezekiel's handsome face. Hmm. For a demon, you are a fool. His gleaming rows of perfectly straight white teeth were begging to be knocked out of his mouth. Zephyr believed he was her guardian angel when he rescued her from the demon horde. Now, she knew he was worse than an ogre. Ezekiel bent forward, and his breath ghosted over Zephyr's caramel brown skin. Something ethereal and sweet replaced the familiar smell of decay. With a curious expression, Ezekiel cupped her wounded cheek, thumb resting on her cracked, chapped lips. He murmured something too low to hear, but it sounded like an incantation to Zephyr's untrained ears. She shut her eyes tight with a grimace. She didn't want to see whatever he was summoning to obliterate her now that he got the information he was seeking. To Zephyr's astonishment, her cuts and bruises began evaporating, leaving behind a faint translucent aura in their wake. You healed me? She asked, dumbfounded. He shrugged. Naturally, I am ascended, not your neighborhood troll. Besides, you possess the key. Now where is the grimoire of Alabaza the Brave? Ha! <sighs> I should have known it wasn't for my benefit. He needs the key, not me. He just wanted to back me into a corner. Take it and leave me trapped here, Zephyr thought while groaning. She shuffled back and forth on the tips of her feet, hopping like a bird, debating what she should tell him and what she should conceal. Zephyr knew where the key was, but she wasn't sure she should give it to him. Zephyr? A chill ran down her spine as Ezekiel pulled her tiny body into his broad, muscular chest. She squeaked in surprise as he palmed her lower back, his free hand on the hilt of his sword. Golden wings encircled them, shielding Zephyr from what she didn't know. She wondered if they changed color at whim. Then she thought about how nice it was to be pressed against him once again. But something inside of her commanded her to shut up, wait, and listen. The air wasn't right. Someone or something was inside the cave with them. Soar! Ezekiel roared, pushing Zephyr to his left. With the way he threw her around like a sock puppet, Zephyr was surprised she didn't have a concussion. Suddenly, a black void opened up and daggers flew out. They beat against Ezekiel's wings like hail, pushing him clear across the room. Zephyr lifted herself midair, smaller wings unable to escape the gale-force winds flooding the room. My, my, my. Zeke in the flesh in our realm. Now they must look down with scorn at their wayward son, those pesky little thrones. Fear not. Your life will be over in a flash. Fear not, sweet angel, for you will not have to die in the age of obsidian to suffer eternal damnation. Zephyr felt her blood stop in her veins, heartbeat slowing, eyes dilating as Cosmos emerged from the void. His pale skin, white hair, and red eyes were unmistakable. He was Prince Cosmos of the wingless demon shifters, Prince Raphael's sworn enemy and illegitimate brother. Shit, Zephyr cursed internally as the powerful demon flicked his wrist and sent Zeke flying across the room. He slammed against a pile of rocks and sank to the ground, motionless. All she could do was watch in horror as Cosmos closed his fist and started to crush him under the weight of his spell. I thank you, Zeke. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been led to the key. It was easy pulling away soldiers from Raphael willing to betray him. But I seem to forget how weak his followers are. And this grimoire will do me no good without the key. Ezekiel screamed as he was crushed even harder, his body folding, being smashed into oblivion. Zephyr hid in the shadows, not on the demon warlord's mind. She was nothing but a puny crow shifter to his awesome power. His energy focused on who he thought held the crappy key to the shitty book he had clutched in his free hand. Those damn traitors must have given it to him. But how? And when? Doesn't matter. I gotta think. I gotta save Zeke. But how? Zephyr's mind raced a mile a minute before going blank. Her uncertainty and self-doubt evaporated, 
replaced with a sense of purpose that threatened to overwhelm her. She knew what she needed to do. Zephyr didn't know how or why. All she could do was feel the awesome power building within her as she took a shaky step towards the battered guardian angel. Chapter 4. Ezekiel. I'm dying. The realization hit him like a bolt of lightning striking on a clear sunny day. Cosmos' attack had done more damage than he anticipated. Ezekiel released a tortured breath, a fine mist of bloody air following soon after. His bones had been crushed all over, and his soul was waning rapidly. He could feel it leaving him. Ezekiel needed access to a pure source of energy to heal. But, Ezekiel thought, he needed to be pure in the first place to receive it. Maybe that was the reason he couldn't resist Cosmos's ruinous energy? It was the only logical answer. As a member of the Ascended, it should have been an easy task to put the Warlord in his place. Instead, Ezekiel found himself on the cusp of death in the demonic realm where his soul would dissipate and disappear, never to be reborn. The skin on the back of Ezekiel's neck tingled. His eyes fluttered open slowly, and the world came into focus. The only thing he could make out was Zephyr's mass of a curly reddish-brown hair. Then her eyes came into view, a bottomless black in color filled with terror and something he couldn't quite read. Ezekiel tried to reach for Zephyr to comfort her, but he couldn't move his hands. He couldn't move a single piece of his bruised and broken body. So instead, he willed himself to regain consciousness fully. Zeke! Two small warm hands graced his battered face, letting him know he wasn't alone and he still lived. With gentleness he didn't know was possible, Zephyr leaned forward and kissed his lips. He would have howled in agony if he could, for even the feather-like caress of her palms and full lips felt like daggers ripping through his flesh. Run. Ezekiel managed to whisper, tears pooling in the corners of his eyes. He didn't want her to leave him, but if she wanted to live, she had to. Ezekiel wished his arms would work so he could wrap them around her and beg her not to go. He thanked Cosmos in that moment for destroying his ability to do so. Her life meant more than his fear of death. He should have just confessed, given up his title, and lived among the humans with her by his side. However, he'd been afraid. Now his fear would cost him his life, and the woman he was coming to realize was a soulmate. Go! He choked out, his voice clear and strong. He couldn't see him, but he knew Cosmos was near. He wouldn't allow the demon to kill her, too. She didn't deserve it. Not when it was his ego that dragged them into his trap. He thought he could just stop the war without calling in reinforcements, and Ezekiel had been dead wrong. Just as Ezekiel was starting to fade away completely, a surge of glorious dark energy surged through him. He groaned with satisfaction. What was the source? Ezekiel was baffled until he saw Zephyr's wings. The black crow feathers hadn't changed, but they glowed in the torchlit cave. A black halo surrounded Zephyr's trembling body as she tried her hardest to infuse Ezekiel with her newfound power. He didn't have time to figure out how Zephyr could hold ruinous and ascended energy within herself at the same time, nor why she chose to share it with him in the first place. All he could do was receive her mercy, promising himself he would repair tenfold once he beat the shit out of Cosmos. Ah, so it was you, young one, who found the grimoire. You are the wretch it chose. How close-minded of me to think one of my own kind couldn't be the key. Well, it's too bad I'll have to kill you in that ascended brat. If only you hadn't tried to save him, I might have allowed you to live. Cosmos barked with laughter from an intermediate distance. Zephyr remained focused on her task, saving Ezekiel's life. He watched, astonished, as she lifted her hands and crossed them over his chest. Her black halo oozed out and surrounded him like an incubator filled with magma. He was being reborn in real time, molded by her heat and desire. Key. Ezekiel shuddered, feeling Zephyr's pain as if it were his own, as a ray of bright light smacked into her back. Zephyr gritted her teeth, never wavering as Cosmos launched an all-out assault from above. The demon prince unleashed a brutal shower on them, the long pillars of white light filled to the brim with ruinous energy. But Zephyr never wavered. Instead, she seemed to grow more powerful by the minute until she burst. Ezekiel heard Cosmos screaming, though he couldn't see him. Everything was white light, like the cave itself had been obliterated and all that existed was Zephyr and him. 
the metallic taste of copper and iron fused in Ezekiel's throat. Blood that had leaked from every place in his body returned. All this time, I was searching for the key when she was right in front of me, Ezekiel thought. Then everything faded to black. Chapter 5 Zephyr Where will you go? Zephyr asked, caressing the bloody scars where Zeke's wings used to be. Magic leaked from her fingertips like a steady shower, and it still amazed her. She didn't know what the hell she did, but somehow. Cosmos was gone, and so was the Grimoire and any trace of his assault. The only thing left behind was her, Zeke, and the key in her back pocket. When she'd woken up, Zephyr found herself sleeping on top of Ezekiel. One of his hands rested in her hair, the other encircling her waist. She freaked out and soon regretted it as he moaned in agony. Since then, they'd sat in virtual silence, only the hum of her energy transfer filling the air. Zephyr knew she was still in shock from everything that had happened. No idea. I'll... <clears throat> I'll report what I know and deliver the key to my commander. The rest is up to them. I will be banished shortly thereafter and allowed to roam this realm and that of the humans. Like clockwork, another agonized moan left his lips. Zephyr watched as he curled over, mouth gaped as a tiny ball of light escaped from within the throne. It floated into the milky miasma left behind by Zephyr's energy bomb and vanished. Was that... your soul? Zephyr asked, frightened. <laughs> Ezekiel shook his head gripping the beat-up cloth still covering his legs as he sat cross-legged in front of her, his back against her hand. For the life of her, she couldn't understand how he could chuckle at her question. No, Zephyr. It is my magic leaving me. My soul is mine. Until my death, that is. Though, I don't know how much time I have left anyway. His voice was distant, tinged with sadness. Does that mean you're not a throne anymore? Will, will your wings come back? Zephyr knew she was asking too many probing questions, but she just couldn't help it. Yes and no. I am no longer a throne, but I am not helpless either. My wings will not return, but I will not remain wingless. We're different in different ways. Only time will tell what my body will become without the blessing of the ascended race. He said. Sounds confusing. Zephyr stopped healing him and sat back, exhausted. As it should be, fledgling. Magic were easy. Anyone would have access to it. Zephyr watched as two long white scars formed on his back. I thank you for sharing your power. However, your duty is done. You have no stake in the war that is coming, Zephyr. Unfortunately, you were just used as a pawn. Your prince will seek vengeance, so it's best you hide in the human realm for now. So, I'm supposed to just sit back and hope some champion rises up to stop Cosmos? That Prince Raphael doesn't find me and rip my feathers out one at a time for disobeying him in the first place. Forget it, Zeke. That ain't happening. Zephyr snapped, even as tears rolled down her cheeks. Ezekiel spun around so he was facing her. What you do is up to you, Zephyr. My words aren't meant to be a deterrent. Far from it. I'm giving you a choice. My magic may be lost to me, but as long as I breathe, I will never stop fighting. He raised his hand and cupped her clammy cheek. Ledgling, the road I take is not an easy one. It is easier to wait for a champion to rise among us than to fight the battle ahead. It was my mistake for not snatching that key from you in the first place. I should have gone alone. And you'd really be dead if you did. Face it, Zeke, you need me and... Zephyr's voice broke before she could say she needed him, too. No, I don't. I want you by my side, but I don't need you there. I'd rather you be safe somewhere far away from the battlefield. Zephyr? Zephyr. Ezekiel reached for her subconsciously, and she came to him gladly. Zephyr curled up in his lap, his strong arms holding her body as she cried her eyes out. She'd been holding everything in, and it felt good to release it all in one go. When she was finished, she listened to his ragged breathing, worried she was too heavy for him in his injured state. 
but every time she tried to pull away, he would hold her closer to his chest. True, she said between sniffles, dabbing her eyes with a piece of torn cloth from her shirt. All our realms might collapse before sun rises on Earth, with the way things are going. Maybe we should just give up. You never struck me as a pessimist, fledgling, he whispered. Well, getting tangled up in a cosmic war for domination with the literal devil will do it to you. She tried to joke. It seemed to hit a chord and they both laughed out loud. Their laughter faded soon after, and silence overtook the cave once more. Zephyr looked up into Ezekiel's handsome face, her breath hitching, his eyes smoldering with need. Death always brought out a sense of urgency. Zephyr knew from experience having seen many of her fellow demons pass away over the decades. She hesitated because the mood was off. Too tense. Too soon. Too everything that should have given her pause. Yet she gave in, leaning into his gentle touch, loving the way his chapped, firm lips felt against hers adoring the way he held her like Zephyr was the most precious thing in the realm. I ache, he began, lips pressed against her throat as Zephyr repressed a soft moan. I ache for you, but this body is weak, and we should wait. We have more important matters to attend to. We barely know each other, she whispered against his lips as they parted again, tongues tangling and untangling sighing as his fingers combed through her mass of kinky curls. There's still time for us to learn. The sun hasn't risen just yet, Zephyr. He smiled again, but this time it was more gentle, hesitant even. Since she was a child, Zephyr thought her very existence was a curse. At that moment, she knew it was a blessing in disguise. There was still time to fight for a future to do the necessary work to ensure peace. In a day's time, she'd know if Nilawazi would reincarnate as a demon too. And maybe, just maybe, she thought as she gazed into Zeke's eyes, overflowing with emotion. Maybe there was room for Zephyr to have a fairy tale ending with a tall, blonde, and handsome asshole of a prince. But first... She had to slay the demon wreaking havoc on the Tri-Realms before she could steal Zeke's heart for good. Thank you for listening to Zephyr's Curse, a Grimoire Chronicles novelette. Written by Zelda Knight. Narrated by Yanka Naderi and Kai Tolliver. Copyright 2019 by Zelda Knight. The End.